All right. I uh, just want to say uh, thank you for everybody coming. Hope uh, everybody got here well and everybody's doing well. Thank you, Jeanette and uh, Salmon. All right. Uh, I just want to start, uh, let you guys introduce yourselves. Okay. Okay, I'm on. I'm on. I forgot. I was waiting for the mic. <laughs> yeah. How you guys doing? I'm um, DJ Sandman. Um, DJ, promoter, I'm just like a hip hop guy, grew up here in Tampa, um, promoted concerts forever in the area, local shows, local artists. Um, I was on 95.7 to beat for like the last 16 years. And um, right now I'm got a new venture, Illsboro Records, and I'm just happy to be here today to speak to everybody. <laughs> So I'm Jeanette Berrios. I am the head of corporate marketing for Symphonic Distribution. Uh, Symphonic's a an independent music distributor based out of here, out of Tampa. Um, we started our roots here, you know, literally about 14 years ago. Um, we, you know, we're lucky enough to be able to distribute, um, you know, music literally from around the world here in Tampa. You know, so this is a Tampa-grown company, uh, and and yeah, basically, you know, we work with independent artists and record labels in terms of helping them, you know, not only distribute their music to the different platforms, but then also collect their royalties, be able to monetize the music more, and then also uh, finding editorial and playlist opportunities within the, the platforms and helping them with their marketing as well. Nice, nice. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of distribution, we're gonna roll right into that. Um, just want to know, just want to ask, uh, how important is uh, placement and uh, di distribution getting your music on playlists? So right now, obviously, you know, as we all know, you know, playlists now are, have become extremely popular. Um, the, on the flip side, too, you know, it is unfortunate that a lot of people just think that making it into a playlist, that's the end game now. You know, like now... Uh, you know, there's even this quote that a lot of the DSPs, which I think even like Spotify was the one that claimed it, saying that being in a playlist is not a marketing plan, right? So yes, it has its advantages that obviously, you know, you're in this playlist, uh, you are going to get traction, but at the same time, you know, you do need a plan, you know, for your release. Because a lot of times, you know, there are instances that yes, you're, you know, your, your track can get placed in, a, in this particular playlist, but some of the consumers are fans of the playlist, you know. So yes, there is an aspect that there might they might discover you, but it doesn't mean that they'll def definitely be following you after they, you know, like they discovered you in this playlist because a lot of people are just fans of the curation of the playlist, right? right. Um, so so it's 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 an element of you know like let's say of, of marketing, and it should perhaps be you know a part of your goals as well, you know. Um, but, but it's not the end game. You know, you definitely need a plan whenever you release, you know, you release a project because, um, you know, like, you'll, if you get support in a playlist, yeah, maybe you're in the playlist for a week or maybe you make it for 30 days and that's it. What next, you know? Um, so, yeah, so it's a part, but you really do need, you know, more than a plan and that can't be the end goal. You know? Okay. Um, so other than playlists, what's another way to distribute your music? So, so definitely, obviously, you know, distribution, like, as some of you, you know, may or may not know, you know, obviously, like, somebody like us, like Symphonic, we help you in the placement of, you know, like, the music and all these different platforms. I think that, you know, beyond the distribution, yes, it's really important to have, you know, have a marketing plan. And sometimes a lot of people might get intimidated by that because it's like, wow, you know, I'm, I'm a musician, I'm a producer, I'm an artist, like, what is a marketing plan? But... But in essence, it's literally, sometimes like I like to break it down that it's like, you know, have some goals of like, what do you want to achieve with this release? You know, whether it's like, let's say I want to definitely, you know, I need to get to at least like 5,000 streams. I want to be able to, yeah, let, let's say I want to get into a couple of playlists because there's also a lot of playlists that are not necessarily done by the, those curation teams. You know, sometimes 
There might be local folks that you know that have a brand, you know, like even like Symphonic. Symphonic has a brand on Spotify that we create playlists. So it's like having like these specific goals of things that you want to achieve and and that plan is, okay, so if I want to reach those 2,000 streams, what do I need to do to get to those 2,000 streams? So it's like, okay, I'm going to share it with all my family members. I'm going to create playlists with it. I'm going to... Send it to Creative Loafing here. So they, you know, like, just find, like, the diff, all of those different little tactics that will be able to get you more streams or, you know, or, or basically get you to the goal that you're looking for. Um, and that marketing plan, I bring it up, too, because those, those marketing plans are really important because if you, if you want to be considered for, for these editorial a playlist, you know, in the and when I'm gonna say you're gonna hear me saying the word DSP because DSP is like these digital service providers, you know, the stores. So I'm talking about Spotify, Apple, Pandora, Deezer, and so on. So the DSPs typically uh, they want to know what's the marketing around that release, and they request that information from the distributor four to six weeks before the release is out. So that that preparation is key. You know, because like we then in turn, whatever information the artist gives to us or the label, we then relay it to you know to that DSP, and then they'll make their editorial you know decisions. Um, and so yeah, so typically in that flow, you know, you you deliver your the music to the distributor, complete the you know like submit these marketing you know like what they call marketing drivers, which is that marketing plan to the you know with enough lead time in order for them, you know, to, for your distributor to be able to communicate it to, um, to the different stores, you know, what's going on. Right. Um, and yeah, and that's like, that's basically one part of it. You know, it's nowadays as well, it's really important, you know, for you to register all your music in a PRO, you know, meaning, you know, ASCAP, BMI, that's, that's really important. You know, CSAC, right. if you get approved right. by them, right. uh, sound exchange as well. Um, that's more related to like you know like perhaps uh, like radio royalties, um, and also making sure you're monetizing your music on YouTube. You know, so YouTube does content ID, meaning mm-hmm. that if somebody were to upload your music into their channel, you can monetize that track in their channel. Right. You know, so it's kind of like protecting. You know, like making sure you're collecting, you're registering all your music, so you're definitely collecting every single cent that that song is making. Be able to exploit it a little bit with like content ID, making sure you're covered there. If anybody's using your music, and then obviously like doing the distribution, you know, which uh, obviously there's hundreds of outlets now, you know, for for your music to be um, to be streamed in. Um, you know, also paying attention to you know where are you becoming popular, like what is your most popular platform, you know, because sometimes it may be it might be a Spotify, it might be Apple. Maybe it's Deezer, you know, whatever platform you see that you're getting traction in, getting familiarized with the tools that those platforms have to be able to share your music. Because all these platforms have tools, you know, like right. they have the little embed that you put in your website or they have codes, you know, promo code that you can share your profile. You know, so getting familiarized and acquainted with all of the marketing tools that they have so then you can use it when you're basically, you know, promoting yourself. And I wanted to say, because mm-hmm. I, I liked how you, that's what I like about Symphonic is the, when you're saying that artists need marketing plans for the releases, because I know so many artists that they'll just get a song and they're, they, they just finished in the studio and they like want it live on everything next week, you know, and they don't have, they're not taking advantage of, you know, the services that you guys offer and they're just putting it out with no plan and just their friends will hear it and that's about it. And you then know. you get disappointed if it's nothing happens. Right, right, yeah. right. But I know, I know, you know, artists are so excited yeah. to, to get their music out. But, yeah, yeah. but if you want to be successful, you gotta you gotta definitely have that plan and have a team helping you to market it and just understand how to make it bigger than it is. Yeah. 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 Um, also, so segueing into uh, radio. Right. Uh, we we've had a conversation on. The importance, of, the importance of radio play and how, how to get your music to these DJs and the importance of that, if you could speak on that. Right. Well, I've, I've been doing, I started doing college radio when I was um, at University of South Florida. 
And when I was doing that as a DJ, I kind of learned how, um, how the music industry would promote, promote records. You know, they would call, like, every day. They have, they have um, every label, they have a, a team that just calls DJs in every market. And they're promoting their releases. And um, I'm talking about when I started, it was in the 90s, like when, say, Wu-Tang Clan and Nas and Biggie, like Puffy used to call the station, like Method Man used to call to get his record played. Like, these guys were really hustling. And all the labels, they make connections with DJs in every market, you know, and it's, it's kind of about relationships. Um, so those relationships go a long way. So they're calling DJs, asking to play their record. And these are, these are major labels that are doing that and independent labels. So then you as an independent artist, you don't really have that advantage because you're just out here by yourself and you don't have anyone calling DJs and trying to hustle your record. You know, so it's, it's just the networking is important with um, and building those relationships with DJs in the city, in different cities. Um, there's DJ coalitions that play in, in every city that are on different, on radios and all over. And it's just good to, to get in with some of these people, you know. Um, so I'm kind of curious, and I feel like it's going to flow into a conversation, but like, do you, would you say that, because obviously there's like the DJs that are in radio stations, right? And those right. I'm sure are really hard to get a hold of, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, do you, obviously then there's like the culture of like, okay, DJs that are playing in different clubs, you know, like, right? right? Mm -hmm. Club DJs, maybe like then DJs that are more, if we have like different types of venues, you know, like let's say maybe the more the restaurants, like, do you think that also, I'm guessing that there's value too in making relationships with like, those like club DJs, you know, like yeah. different tiers, you know? And if yeah. you make those relationships, do you think that that makes enough noise that then the radio folks will, will care? Or are those radio folks like so into the major labels, you know, that, that it's like... It, it, it's, it's kind of a, a hard line right there because there's DJs on the major radios. They're, a lot of them today are, are kind of... A lot of them are stuck to what they can what they can play and what they can break. But there are certain markets and certain DJs on community stations that can help break the music. You know, um, like me being on the beat, we did we did a local segment every Sunday night where we play local music called Future Flavors, and that was pretty big because we're playing people from Tampa and you know St. Pete, just all of this this whole Tampa Bay area. On the major on the major radio, and um, it was a good look, and actually people hear them and people pay attention to that to that music. Um, and there's there's stations and other markets that do the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, they might a mix show mix show was real big. It's hard to get into rotation on radio, but if you can build relationship with mix show DJs, that goes a long way. Um, for instance, like Buck Sosa from from Tampa here. He's kind of hot right now, and he just had a record bubbling in the city. You know, I saw it on Instagram. I saw kids in high school reacting to it at the games. It's everybody. And then me as a mix show DJ, you know, I didn't even know Buck Sosa. No one ever talked to me about playing his record, but I'm like, this record is hot. Like, we need to put this on the radio. So I would play it every weekend on the mix show. Like, every weekend you could turn on the radio. Like, you wouldn't hear it during the daytime, but at night in the mix show... I would play it just because I wanted to support the record, you know, and support someone out of the city. And I finally met him afterwards, and he ended up doing a, um, a deal with 300 Entertainment. And, and, you know, he got an album deal and everything. But it kind of, we helped him. I feel like we helped him make his song bigger by exposing it to so many more people on the radio, you know. And I didn't have a relationship with him. But I'm a DJ that looks for music that's hot, you know, so I wanted to, I wanted to help him out. You know, and there's people like that in other cities, too. Um, there's DJs like that everywhere. Like you were saying, like DJs in coffee shops, restaurants. Because yeah. there's, you know, there's all kind of different, different styles of music. There's club music, there's chill music, um, conscious music. But you just got to find, find the DJs that are going to get behind your record to help you out. 
Now, I actually have another question. Uh huh. <laughs> For enough. Are there, because I know that when you reach out to, let's say, if you reach out to, to edit, edit, like, editors, right, and the, right. the press or whatever, there's, like, always, like, best practices and things that they don't like. Right. What are, like, things that DJs don't like to receive that it's, like, do not send me this music this way, or, like, a pet peeve? A pet peeve? You know, that it's, like, you do it this way, so it's, like, it saves you, you time, know, and it, like... Yeah. yeah, I mean, a lot of people will send me their links, like, to music, like, on Snapchat, or on Instagram, and it's just so fast, and there's so many messages. So, like, I'll look at it, but I have a thousand other things going on, so I don't go back to hear that record, you know? Like, I personally like emails or a call here and there, you know? Because, like, like, back to the major labels, they call you every week about their records that they're promoting, you know? So they're always, they're in your ear, not every single day, but... Weekly or bi-weekly, they're in your ear about trying to get this record played. And, and email, email and like phone calls are, are pretty much the best. But I'm, I'm not a fan of getting the music on Snapchat or, or in the Instagram, messenger. Yeah. 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 I've, yeah. I've, I've heard that from some edit- editors that they're like, that the artist will reach out to them through Instagram and say, hey. Support. I mean, it's, it's yeah. good to reach out and make the connection yeah. on Instagram, but after but not, that. Not a form of major communication. You know, right, that's right. What I mean. Right. Yeah. Uh, as far as you, is there any pet peeves or any direction in reaching you and what you do? And for me, um, well, it's a little bit different, but I feel like whenever, whenever you do reach out, you know, to. I think like to any industry professional and I also reach out to people too, you know, so I think to me most importantly, it's like reaching out when you have something, you know, to offer, um, understanding that sometimes like you might make a connection today, but it might not be the right time now, but yes, having a way of like organizing your contacts, you know, like I, like for instance, for me, like since we go to all the conferences and, you know, we're involved in a lot of networking events, like I'll typically have like a spreadsheet with like all these people's contacts because like business cards get lost you know along the way um you know organizing like okay where did i meet this person where are they from you know like so i can at least reference you know in the future what do they focus on you know like what's their specialty um because yeah because like again like there might be times that i can't connect with a person now you know because there's nothing we can do together but maybe in the future you know um but yeah and and and, um i think it's like being considerate of somebody's time and then also, uh, you know, like, I feel like in this industry, it's really important to follow up because sometimes you might reach out to somebody and maybe they don't get back to you at a certain time, but follow up, you know, if you follow up, they might, you know, they might respond, you know, so. Yeah, I think that's important mm-hmm. because, because like I said, like a lot of people hit me, you know, initially on Instagram or Facebook and then we never really follow up, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. I might be in the middle of some other stuff, have yeah. a, a bunch of stuff going on at that moment, but. We can follow up a little later, mm-hmm. you know. And I, I even feel like, because I've, I've told folks, it's like, hey, I can't do this now, but, like, literally hit me up in three months or four months. And if they do that, then I'm like, this person was listening. Like, now I take them even more serious when they actually did hit up right. in the time frame that, it, you know, like, that you kind of requested it, you know? Yeah. Um, but, um, but, yeah, I think, I think that's overall. Okay, so, so the steps of building great relationships is very important. Uh, I wanted to yeah. talk about something we uh, spoke about is uh, publicists, right? Uh, having certain publicists. Well, yeah, I was, I was, I was mentioning that. Um, that kind of goes back to the marketing plan that she was talking about because a lot of artists miss on that. You know, they 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 spend their money in the clubs and popping bottles or whatever, but you want to like I've learned that publicists go a long way. Because they get you, they get you to places that you can't get to all these other media outlets and and blogs and like music news sites mm-hmm. um a lot of the a lot of the artists that that you hear now like little Uzi Ver and Lil Baby and all these guys they all had great publicists when they first started that got them everywhere at the same time you know I mean you can put out a, a record locally but you're trying to get you're trying to reach other markets, and if you have a good publicist, they can help you um, get press in, in other markets as yeah. well. And a lot of artists kind of skip skip that, you know. Mm-hmm. One tip too, there, because like sometimes you know, I feel like 
it, if you have a publicist, maybe you have a budget, you know, and sometimes right. people don't have a budget. But one of the things that I always recommend folks is that, you know, nowadays, like for instance, on your Spotify for, if your music is on, on streaming platforms, you know that there's going to be a Spotify for artists. Uh, and then there's also the section of, um, of people that are similar to your sound. You know, so I always recommend it's like, okay, look up those people, right? Those folks that are showing up that sound like you. Right. And start doing Google searches of like, okay, let's see who has written about this person, you know? Right. Um, about these artists. And, um, and, yeah, and then looking for, you know, so for those writers, and typically a lot of writers nowadays, they are somewhat accessible. You know, like, at least like through Twitter, I've always noticed that they, they'll have a link or something, you know, that if you really deep, dig deep a little bit, right. you can find that person's email. Because, like, editors want to find music, you know, like... They're looking for new music. So kind of starting your own little database of like, okay, yeah. these are my main contacts. And starting literally from like, from local, you know, so it's like, if you are making music here, and you know, we have Creative Loafing. Creative Loafing is like the alternative, you know, like publication, you know, alternative music. So it's like, hey, there's Ray Rua, you know, like that's, that's your local guy. Right. Uh, maybe if you want to expand a little bit more, Tampa Bay Times, they're a little bit more pop, you know, like more mainstream, but like kind of grow your circle. It's like, okay, let me find then who's talking in Lakeland, who's talking in Orlando, you know, kind of expanding. Yeah. Because that's typically also what like a PR uh, representative is going to do. Like they have local, national, and right. worldwide or whatever presence, right. you know, so. And they, so, they have those contacts. Yeah. But, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have the budget for that, what she's saying is you can research. Yeah, just and, research it yourself. And try to get those contacts yeah. and, and um, build a relationship with mm -hmm. them. Yeah, and the same thing, like, if you know, like, okay, my music is going to be really friendly, you know, let's say Atlanta, Philly, wherever it may be, mm -hmm. do the same thing over there. Like, look, like, independent music Atlanta journal or, like, Atlanta newspaper, you know, Right. Do those little research and and develop those contacts, and then also when you reach out, when you do reach out to that contact, um, you know some tips there that I always recommend is like, you know definitely don't attach your music, you know don't be attaching a file of your music because like you never know like you know like how big that file is, will it bump it down, you know like what that person's inbox right. looks like. Share a link, Spotify link maybe if you want to make it private. Mm -hmm. uh, where a person can listen to your music, share a couple of your, you know, and, and, and not send a very long email either, you know, just kind of be precise, courteous, you know, with this person's time, introduce yourself, maybe in the subject line. Um, subject line to me is, like, super important. It's, like, you know, make it seem as interesting as possible, you know, like, that this person, like, they, let's say, you know, I don't know, like, oh, this person sounds like Amy Winehouse with... I don't know, uh, Cardi B, you know, you're like, wow, I kind of want to listen to that. You know, what is that about? You know, so tease it, you know, that it's like, okay, let me try to paint a picture so they can, like, see that subject line. It interests them. You're not sending them way too much information, but, you know, be concise. But it is important to kind of have, like, on your back pocket, like, your own press contacts, you know, as you're starting to develop, you know. Yeah. Um, I also want to... You to speak on the voice strategy. Oh, voice strategy. Mm -hmm. Voice yeah. strategy in music. Yeah, yeah. So now you know we know that there's a lot of like listening devices now. You know that we play you play music in. You know, like let's say Alexa. Uh, there's an Echo. All these devices, which they're also tied to uh, to DSPs to stores, right? You know, so Alexa with Amazon, Google with Echo. Uh, so yeah, so now there's there's uh, now there's literally a voice strategy, you know. So it's like, how do you make your music friendlier for those devices? Because a lot of people listen to music in those devices. Um, so yeah, so so that's like a little bit. It's more like a we call it like metadata game, you know. So it's like, you know, once you're uploading your releases, whether to to DSPs or particularly to to the stores, you know, through your distributor, being able to use uh, keywords to describe your music that you associate with, like, okay, how would you uh, ask for a device, you know, for like, hey, play me, you know, like, let's say a lot of people might be like more like, play me classic hip hop or play me lo fi. So you being, you doing the same thing with your music, adding to it in your metadata description those little keywords to take it in consideration so then. When folks are trying to, you know, obviously stream music through the devices, 
that your music ranks a little bit higher, you know? That has its own kind of like algorithm, in a sense. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind if you think that your music is friendly for those types of devices, you know? Okay, sounds good. Uh, Sam, man, uh, I want you to speak on uh, the label, the Illsboro record label. On Illsboro? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so pretty much um, Illsboro was, was created um, when I left 95.7 The Beat last year, like right at the top of the, the pandemic, and they did a bunch of cuts. And um, actually, Jorge from Symphonic Distribution, he just reached out to me like, hey, um, I love what you, you know, you've done for the local scene, and let's just sit down and talk about some ideas. And I had a couple meetings with him, and we came up with um, doing a label that would focus, I mean, not mainly locally, but it's kind of locally based, and and um, to help artists out of here get out there further and get their music heard more than, than just in Tampa. So we had a few meetings, and, um, and I was excited about it because I'd always wanted to work with Symphonic. You know, I love what they were doing for the community, and they're Tampa-based, and it was just a real good fit. You know, we went through, we went over some names, and um, I, I, I finally went with Hillsboro because um, kind of Hillsborough County, but it's hip hop and it's not just local, you know, because I'm trying to put out music from all over the world, not just in Tampa. But um, with Illsboro, we're, we're distributing artists and I have Symphonic's team, you know, behind me, back of me, and they're helping with the marketing and playlisting that, that um, she was speaking on earlier. And it was just a great situation. You know, for me to, to for me to jump into, I've always been, you know, since I grew up here, I've always been doing, trying to help local artists out. Um, from in the in the early two thousands, I had a website called TampaHipHop.com, and that was really big. That was like pre Facebook, and that kind of connected a lot of artists and DJs in the city, um, like all different type of artists, you know, and all different type of DJs, and then we would throw. We would throw shows, we would throw showcases for artists, and I always wanted to start putting out records as well. I put out a few 12 inches back then with some local artists, when that was before the, the whole MP3 and digital DJing, but um, this, Illsboro just gave me an opportunity to continue my passion for trying to help artists and, and get them out there. Uh, could you briefly speak on how any artists could reach you, or... Uh, getting connections with the uh, Ilsboro Records? Um, yeah, we have the website, Ilsboro.com. Um, if you're an artist, you can go on and submit your demo there. Um, it's, it's just an option. Uh, there, there's many options to distribute your music. You know, there's, you know, a lot of people use DistroKid or TuneCore or stuff like that. But if, if we choose you to, to put you out through Ilsboro, you're not paying those yearly fees to upload your music, um, and you're going to have a team behind you um, with, with more resources than you just doing it yourself. But illsboro.com is, is the website, and you can submit your music there. You can also hit me on all the social medias and then just build that relationship and at DJ Sam and 813 or um, Illsboro Records online as well on Instagram. But the website is the best way to get to get to us and get your music to us. And then we review it. Um, myself, a few other people, we review it and we kind of see what will work for the label and what has potential. And then and we'll go from there. Yeah. So moving on from the local vibe, I've noticed there's a big Latin, Latin scene coming in, especially with hip hop and music. Um, uh, could you speak on just uh, anything about that, uh, the whole Latin side, me being half Latin myself? Hey, well, what's your background? What's your... <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican. Oh, really? Puerto Rican oh, cool. and uh, black. So, yeah, if you could just speak on that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So, obviously, yeah, there's been, like, obviously, it's inevitable to see, like, a lot of, like, you know, like, there's been huge exponential growth with Latin music. Uh, funny enough, like, 
even um, mm -hmm. I know WrestleMania is this uh, is today and tomorrow, and now like Bad Bunny is in WrestleMania. Right. He's gonna be wrestling, so sure. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, I think that's an uh, you know. I, it's important that if you see that your music is being consumed, you know, perhaps in different, you know, like Latin American countries, um, collaborations, online collaborations these days, you know, the, you're seeing, I think like that's also one of the things that, that is a really big missed opportunity, you know, for artists, um, even as a strategy to grow your numbers, you know, like your streaming numbers. Um, so... So yeah, paying attention, you know, like uh, to, you know, paying attention to your numbers, you know, like where your music is being streamed. If you feel like if there is an inclination that you're seeing that in Latin America somewhere, you know, it is uh, being picked up, then, you know, perhaps looking online to see if there's any possible collaborations with artists that you can do in that region, you know, specifically. Um, you know, we see it a lot now. Like between, you know, like la even Latin artists doing collaborations with like uh, Brazilian artists, you know, like doing that, those, co you know, cross collaborations. Um, and by doing those collaborations, it's, you know, like more specific, you know, to regions. It's great because then you're expanding, you know, like your audience. Because if, you know, that particular artist has a fan base and you're introducing them to your music, it's very likely that there's an affinity there, you know. Um, so, so keeping an eye out for that, you know, and, and nowadays there's so many, you know, now through COVID, I feel like, uh, people have learned even more, like how to do collaborations online, you know, so there's enough tools out there for, for you to be, you know, doing that and just taking in consideration because, um, obviously, you know, uh, Spanish music continues to grow and expand, um, Obviously, as you know, like I think we were talking about this once that it's like the the goal of all you know, all cell phone providers is for everybody to have a, a smartphone in their hand, you know. And if you have a smartphone, you can listen to music. So you know, you continue as as all these providers continue to push. Uh, you know, like they include different. You know, sometimes even in your cell phone subscription, they'll include you a music subscription. You know, for for you to be streaming music, so so there's a lot of vast you know consumption there you know specifically in Latin America. Um, you're also seeing it in Asia as well, but you know we are so close, especially people here in Florida that we you know we're used to these like blends you know of, like exactly. everybody's like a mix of something. You yeah, know? I've also seen um, a big scene coming out of Africa as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. Africa. Yeah, yeah. Africa is, is is blowing up for sure. The Afro, yeah, Afro mm -hmm. beats. Afro beat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, same, if you find, if I think, like, if you find, if you, oh, my God, I'm sorry. <laughs> if you find, um, you know, the opportunity to, to do any sort of, like, international collaborations, definitely, you know, yeah, go for Yeah, definitely it. a big move. Mm -hmm. mm. Nice, nice. Um, thank you. Uh, I also want to talk about the... Um, the collaboration between Symphonics and Hillsborough Records, um, and how, how that how that works exactly, like how you guys work together exactly, the details. Um, I mean, they pretty much gave me the opportunity to to release um, and distribute, you know, artists that I that I want through the Symphonic platform and through using their resources. Um, which is a beautiful thing to me, and what what I was saying earlier when when Jorge and I got together and spoke about it, um, we wanted to provide a platform for artists in Tampa just to get a little more push and and whatnot. And what I was saying earlier, if you're doing it through you know other distributors, you're not going to get. I don't think you're going to get the same attention that, that we're giving you and the Symphonic team is giving you because with Illsboro, we're helping you with your artwork. We're helping you get your music to um, not only distribute it on, on, on the DSPs, but also to DJs and um, worldwide. That's, that's one of the things that I do for the artists. Um, I'm pushing their music out to through my network, you know, of all the connections that I've made being in the industry for years as well. 
And I just think it's just it was just a good a good collaboration for what they do for the city and with my knowledge and my experiences and we can just use my resources and their resources together to help to help push the artists. Cuz a lot a lot of times with local artists I think I said this before when we spoke that as as a DJ it's hard to get some of the some of the music from the artists. Um, they just put it up on the DSPs and you know, it might be doing well, but as there's still DJs in, you know, every club, different venues, restaurants, everywhere, all over the city, and they can't just go on Spotify and download the music. So it's hard to get, if you don't, if you don't have that music available to get to the DJs, it's just harder for you to reach more people, you know? And that's, that's one of the things that, um, that I'm trying to help do as well, just get the music to DJs locally and, and nationally, like all over. I mean, some of our releases have already been, they're played on Sirius XM, um, Sway in the Morning, Rock the Bells, but I'm just using all my resources to help push the music out to other people, not just, not just on Spotify or, or Apple or Tidal, but you want to get it into the hands of people that are going to be playing it as well for their audiences. And I noticed uh, Symphonix has a stable of artists, so mm -hmm. so they do distribution, but they also um, sign artists. Uh, we do we do certain deals. Um, particularly, it's more we we like to focus it more on the like the marketing side. Um, you know, so it's it's marketing budgets, and essentially we try to you know like develop like a marketing strategy for it that includes you know whether from ads to like. Maybe radio promotions, um, influencer campaigns, a little bit of everything. Um, and yeah, and it, it, for those approaches, then you know, obviously, typically we need to see like a history of, of you know success, you know, within the artist. Um, you know, there are some cases, and if it has to be very, very promising, you know, because uh, obviously everybody wants to recoup, you know, the fun as well, you know. Um, but yeah, but there are certain instances that we, you know, that we have done those types of deals as well. Mm -hmm. uh, if an artist was just to start, right, just starting, maybe today or to, uh, this month, what would be some advice you would give them to to go about starting their music? In, in I think I would say, you know, with this, you have to have a lot of consistency. You have to have passion. You have to have consistency, you know, being persistent. Obviously, it is a very, it, it's a difficult industry, you know, in general, because, like, I feel like sometimes, like, the odds of you being successful are minimum, you know? Um, but I feel like the goal should always be, you know, to, you know, have a sustainable career, you know? Like, that it's not like you want to break out, be famous, be, main, you know, like, be super mainstream because sometimes those have huge dips. You know, as, as big as it came up, that's how it comes down. You know, so right. um, so I feel like it's 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 about you know it's about being consistent. I feel like in this industry you have to be consistently learning as well because it does change so rapidly. You know, it's it's really associated with technology, so all these platforms are constantly changing. Um, so it's really important to you know like. Perhaps find like a good publication that you like that it's like, you know, like we're really big on education. You know, we have a blog that we're consistently updating. Uh, if you subscribe to it, you also get, you know, you get your newsletters. We're always putting in their information, um, you know, kind of like latest trends, uh, you know, how to how to grow in the industry. You know, so I feel like it's it's a commitment that, that you have to be, you know, you have to be patient. Uh, you have to always be mastering your craft. Um, I think it's important too to you know find a team, and by a team this means that sometimes these are going to be your friends. You know, like maybe you have a friend that's really good at marketing; they're really good at social media. So that's your buddy that might be able, you know, if, if they feel passionate about what you're doing and they want to support it. You know, finding maybe a graphic designer. You know, building building a group of people that you really trust and that you know I feel like that together like. If you all believe in the same common goal, like you will get somewhere. Um, and um, yeah, I would say it's like yeah, it's like building your team, being consistent, being yeah. humble as well. Um, Definitely. You know, I think humble. that's really important. It goes a long way. Um, 
you know, because you never know who you're talking to and what relationship you, you know, like, right. you know, right. what, you don't want to burn any bridges, you know. Um, and networking is, mm -hmm, is really yeah. big, you know, like, if you're an artist, you need to go out to, you know, to events that other artists are doing, like, shout out to Mike <laughs> Mass, you know, he does, he does a lot, you know, if you're an artist and he's doing showcase and putting people on stage, you want to, you want to go to that event and meet him and meet his people. Yeah. And, you know, there's other people that do the same thing because what I, I've learned that relation is like the whole industry kind of moves on relationships, you know. And like she said, you never know who you're going to meet, who you're talking to when you meet them. But it's good to be out and be seen, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're trying to you're trying to get people to hear your music and connect with fans. Um, you need to be where they're at. You know, you need to be where people like you that are doing the same thing are at. And um, and just network and and don't give up either, because it, it does get discouraging. You know you're gonna have highs and lows, um, and I know you know there's people that always want to be. You know a lot of people's goal is to get on the radio because the radio kind of makes superstars, but you know that's that's a hard thing to be a superstar. But you can still have a fan base and do your music and do you. And when that time comes, maybe you will blow up and be a superstar. But, um, you know, working with Dynasty from that I met here in Tampa, I mean, we, we just got together and did, did a mixtape. And we were doing shows here locally. And that brought us all over the world. You know, like, we were touring Europe multiple times, just making music out of Tampa, you know, because we didn't give up. Um, you know, we're not... We're not like, you know, on the Grammys and stuff like that at this point, but we're still able to, to move around in the industry just from the connections we met and the relationship and just being consistent and putting out good music, you know. But it does get discouraging, but if, if it's your passion, don't give up because, I mean, it's what you love and you okay, just keep doing you it. <laughs> oh my God. It's actually an alarm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. And show up, you know, like I said, go to go to, to Mike Mass's events, go to, to other events where artists are and, and fans, you know. You don't gotta go every every night, but just be seen. You gotta be on the scene yeah. for people to like accept you and to respect you. And you I know, to know you're serious. And I think it's important too, even for the scene here locally, you know, because yeah. like there, I feel like there's a lot of little tribes, you know, in collectives. So it's just like supporting each other. You right. never know who you're gonna meet there. That maybe you need a con a new contact for a video, or you know, right. maybe somebody that can do, you know, that can produce you your next track or something. You know, so it's I think it's like it's good to just see what's going on, you know, in general. So just like for the networking aspect of it, and who knows what opportunities it can open up for you as well. Right. All right, uh, I think we're about to roll into the Q&A. Q&A. Yeah, I have a simple question. Can friends to the preferred marketing drivers, do you have something like a know-how in package so we know exactly what has to do with the marketing drivers and all the marketing aspects? I can show you here, but I don't know. Do you have something that we, like a sample, a little tool, can you know, show one so I, I always tell people the best way is literally, like, literally looking at the marketing driver's form. Like for us at Symphonic, because like that marketing driver's form is built based on what the stores are looking for. You know, so the radio, like, they'll be like, oh, like what radio campaigns are you doing? What's your digital budget? Um, you know, are you doing any influencer campaign? So all that stuff is what the, you know, I always say like, okay, all, the, all those things that we're asking for is what the store is requesting. So that can also give you inspiration on what your marketing plan has to look like. You know, like what things to incorporate. Mm. We don't have a checklist, uh, but I can probably maybe send you like a couple of blog posts that we've put together of like, hey, these are like, just like a basic structure of the plan. Uh, we have like another one that we did like just like a, a bunch of ideas of like how to promote your release for free, you know? Uh, you know, that are just like low hanging fruit stuff that would, can be done. But, but definitely looking at the form gives you ideas of like, oh, next time in my marketing plan I should include this or I should try to do this or, 
you know, or at least work towards getting that sort of, con you know, contact if it's a radio situation or if it's an influencer. I mean, it's like, it kind of gives you ideas already, you know. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good feedback. Four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. It's recommended to you submit your release four to six weeks, and at four weeks, we have to start submitting that information to the DSPs. Okay, so you upload the release to your distributor, and when you upload the release, you also submit your marketing drivers. Yeah. Four to six time. weeks. Mm -hmm. right. And then also we do recommend that it's like, okay, because like in those marketing drivers, let's say that you had a bunch of target publications, right? Because like that's something that you're going to include. Like, hey, I'm, I'm planning to reach out to all these publications, you know, for support. Rele and, and I have an exclusive with X publication, right? Once the release comes out, then you can also reach back out to us again. And at least like for the specific situation of, of, of Symphonic, that same marketing driver's form says, is this new information or are you giving me an update? So you give an update, right, two weeks later, let's say after the release is live. And then you can give us then all follow-up information of like, hey, I was able to actually secure these five publications. And now the video has X amount of views. Uh, this person picked it up. You know, like give us a full update because we also uh, give updates to the DSPs again. You know, if something's performing well, because they might not pick it up in initially, but if they do see that it's getting traction, then you know, uh, because of those follow-ups, then we can provide information a second time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And one thing too, this is like small, but I feel like it's helpful that it's sometimes like those publications that you have as targets, that you say, oh, I'm gonna reach out to these five newspapers or blogs or whatever it may be, including as well the reach of those publications. You know, like maybe in a little bracket put like, oh, this publication has like, you know, a rough estimate of like 500,000 followers, maybe this one has a million, you know, because a lot of people that might be reading that information, they don't know, like, for instance, what, what what's the reach of creative loafing in Tampa, you know, like, they'll just, you know, like, it's easier if you're, like, providing them as much information as possible, you know, so I, I always recommend people just round up the number of, like, what their entire followers are and put it on the side real quick, you know. Right. And once you do that once, if you're always reaching out to those publications, you can just save that information, a Word document or something, and you just copy paste it again, you know? Nice. Nice. <laughs> 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 All right. Hi. So my question um, is going back to talking about the, like, the local scene. Um, I was just wondering if either of you guys have any advice as to how, like, not just Tampa, but any city as a whole, um, can work towards reaching people outside of the scene itself, like reaching everyday listeners, um, so that when you go into events, it's not just the artists that are participating um, in the in the shows or the events themselves, uh, but people that are just there to hear the music or to be fans. It seems like go for it. Uh huh. That's okay, but you no, can go, for it. go ahead. that with music. 
music brings now a foodie crowd that is not personally connected to the musician. Now we might. I like that answer. Yeah. Mike Mass, everybody. Let's Mike pull Mass. another chair. Let's pull another chair here. Yeah. <laughs> and I never thought about the, the food truck thing, but that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. But I mean, it, it is hard. You know, it's hard for everybody to get, to get your music heard in other cities and other people to connect to it. But it goes back to just building, trying to build relationships with, with influencers in those cities and, and in other markets. And they can help get your music out as well. Um, that goes a long way as well. To understand your question a little bit better, so you're saying uh, how to connect with other cities, or can you repeat it again? I just want to. Yeah, so I'm, um, I'm saying within a city, mm -hmm. like say I go to a show in Tampa, um, and I was specifically talking about hip hop shows because mm -hmm. that's just what I have the most experience with, mm -hmm. but um, when I go to these shows, if I'm seeing that most of the crowd are other hip hop artists mm -hmm. that are, you know, it's sort of a, 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 the scene repeats itself and it's like artists that perform in other shows are coming to this show to support you, which is great. But if there's a, um, a shortage of people outside of the scene mm -hmm. that are coming just for the consumption of music and not to network or not to advance their own career, um, then I, I wonder yeah. about, yeah, just, just fans. Um, you know, I'm, I'm asking how do you reach those people so that the music grows um, beyond the scene itself. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree then, you know, like totally with Mike's uh, comment there, like incorporating other, other elements, other creative elements, you know, so, so, mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Associating in other ways. Yeah. I feel like something too here that that's pretty interesting because like I, there's always this this you know theory you know in terms of breaking artists like around college you know like colleges and universities, um, and I feel that it, it it's a little bit you know it's it's a little bit tough because I feel like our scene is a little bit more artsy you know that sometimes those mm -hmm. you know like that demographic college students might not necessarily be you know gravitating towards that you know. Right. Um, but I feel like there's a huge opportunity here being that, you know, we have USF, UT, you know, like these bigger colleges kind of trying to do something that caters to, you know, that younger, you know, like demographic, like those kids, you know, like kids or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, I don't know, like I feel like there's something there that hasn't really been tapped, you know? Right. Um, it's, it's still f food for thought, you know, but being that we are, you know, like we have these heavy colleges here, you know. So you put out music? You do music as well? Um, I used to. I don't, not so much. Nice. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but he gave yeah. up. See, he's like. <laughs> yeah, I, I Don't get away. discouraged, man. I mean, he's saying you're nice, so. Go out. Just, yeah, yeah just, you know. <laughs> Eventually, you're, you're going to connect with some fans, you know. Eventually, yeah, yeah. Your, your music will connect with some people, and they'll want to come and see you. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, Thank you. it's definitely tough. It's definitely a long journey, but it'll happen. You know, it's, it's, if the music is good, then it'll happen. You know? yeah. yeah. How long have you been DJing? How long have I been DJing? How many years have you been DJing? Man, I started DJing like. Give me a rough number. <laughs> a rough number? <laughs> <laughs> um. 20, 30 years, 25 years. Did you start a record label before it was Um, I did, I put out some 12 inches before it Yeah, we just, you know, grabbed some money up that we were making from DJing parties and pressed up some records and put them out. You know, I did that. And then I, I worked with um, Two For One as well, who put out Rated R. Yeah. Um, in here tonight was a big record, and that went on to get signed by Universal Records. So I worked like real close with them in the whole development of that song and that deal. Thanks. Yeah. So I was always trying to put out some records, you know. And then, you know, Illsboro is just now. Now that I'm not doing, um, I'm still doing radio. I'm on 95.7 The Beat in California at the moment. I'm not on the beat here locally um, now since all the cuts, but. Um, I was on the radio like every day, you know, like every day of the week. 
I'm doing mixes, I'm at the station, and I didn't have as much time dedicated, you know? Because, you know, that's why you might not have seen me at all your shows, you know, because I got a lot going on. And so I couldn't be everywhere. But now that I'm not doing um, mixes and on the radio every single day, I have a lot more time, you know, to dedicate to Illsboro and to help to help push artists and just and just help the scene in general, you know. Yeah, a little more peace and less stress. <laughs> Sorry, am I next? Okay, okay, okay. First of all, good afternoon. No. My name is uh, Tiger. I have a few questions, so I'm just going to ask one right now, and then if there's other people, I'll just come back. Um, my first question, and just to kind of preface this, I have a more pessimistic view of the industry. So this question is for you two, um, both of you. Um, and my question is, how much of popular music, and you could take rap if that's your genre, in your opinion, is from social engineering and label pipelining as opposed to genuine talent and distribution. So a little bit, <laughs> so a little bit more like higher up, I guess. The question would be like, are there industry plants? How much, how much of the label has to do with with the success that we see that the general public sees in the music industry? Mm -hmm. mm. I mean, I th I think. I think there are like plants, like you said. I mean, the popular music is, is kind of like I've seen the trend where, you know, a record might be hot in some some city, and then the label will spend the the, the label sees a reaction to that record in that person's market, and then they will spend you know, millions of dollars, they'll sign that artist, spend millions of dollars to, to put them in the public. Um, like doing radio, they're, they're all fighting to get that song on the radio. You know, there, there might be, there might be, there might be five or six different records that you can play every week on the radio, you know, add something new, but, but you know, the label will take that artist and they'll just hammer it and spend money in every market to get it out and, and just to get it everywhere at the same time. And I don't think it has a lot to do with, like you said, with like, like a talented artist. It's just, it's just a, it's just something that people, you know, gravitated to on social media. And, uh, and then the labels think they can make, they can monetize off of that. And they just throw a lot of money at it and, and get it out to the public. And it just, I don't know, it just, it's something different, you know, than, yeah, yeah. Than like a true artist with talent, it's just they latch on to something. Like I, I agree with what you said. It's kind of like an industry, not really a plant, but it's just they will spend a lot of money to promote to promote that whatever someone in some cities gravitating to. They're just they want to take advantage of that that quick money. I think. Yeah. Can I can I rebuttal for a second? So yeah. the reason why it kind of popped in my mind is because I heard. Or some an idea came to my mind about a particular rapper I'm not going to say, but who's not talented in my opinion at all. Right. But he just kind of fit a profile that maybe I'm thinking that uh, a label might look for in terms of an archetype for a rapper or for a person they want to uh, promote because they feel like socially people will gravitate towards that or they'll be more marketable than others. They can just make a bag and then dip. So that's what made me ask the question of you, and I think I. Your answer was kind of the answer I was kind of looking for from right. a person in your position. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, one thing I, I do believe, yeah, it's like, you know, sometimes there is like that machine, you know. One thing, too, though, that, that's, that's a growing trend is that more there's more independent music now than ever. You know, and now collectively independent music is like technically the fourth major, you know, because now major record labels are, you know, like, they're actually kind of drying up, you know, like they have very archaic systems, um, you know, so they're, they're kind of stuck in another, you know, in just like another time. And right. now with like, obviously, there being more access to information, then they're not really gatekeepers anymore of like, you know, oh, how do I put my video on MTV or how do I put do this or how do I get this billboard? Now, there's a lot of transparency, you know, so... So there is a more like optimistic outlook in terms of like independent music and how it's growing, you know, even to the point that 
I found this like really, really interesting that you know there is a there's an independent collective called Merlin that you know like even like companies like us like Symphonic like we are part of Merlin and they basically um, negotiate you know the rates let's say with like the YouTube and Spotify you know so so the independent music community can get the same rates as uh, as like if a major record label were negotiating with a YouTube or a Spotify, right? And uh, and now whenever those negotiations takes place, Merlin typically is like the second one that, that a lot of these DSPs negotiate with. So right. that also leads you to believe of like the importance of, you know, and, and how strong independent music is, you know? Because right. um, obviously, when these negotiate renegotiation takes place, they're gonna go like from the most important, you know, down. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, it's like, yeah, it's a, you know, like there are cases. Yes, it, it is a machine, um, and unfortunate too. I feel like, you know, because of that, it's unfortunate that then a lot of you know artists like then that becomes the end goal, you know, because then it's like. You know, it's the machine because then us as individuals, we are allowing it to be the machine and we also want it. You know, like that then has become the ultimate goal, you know, mm -hmm. um, which I don't feel like it, sh it definitely it should. You know, like obviously like we're independent, we're fiercely independent. You know, we believe in independent music, um, you know, and, and obviously, yeah, like, you know, mainstream music is going to be, you know, what it is. It's like, you know, mass consumption. It's marketing a product, you know, but can it, can it be done independently? Yeah, there's people that are doing it independently, you know. Yeah. Adele is independent. Taylor Swift is independent. Obviously, they had to get to a certain point, but there are a lot of success, you know, successful cases of people that have stayed independent, you know, for a very right. long time. Right. right but, thank you. But like you said, there's a lot of, there's some terrible rappers, you know, and terrible music that they market um, and put a lot of money behind, you know. I see that every day. <laughs> I do, yeah, you do, you do. You know, and, and it gets discouraging for artists that, you know. Have, yeah, they have yeah. a craft. Hey, uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, I'm an artist, I go by The Black Ace, and my question was, like, for you as a distributed company, and for you as a DJ, now label owner, as small, smaller artists, should we focus on releasing around or on holidays and trying to fit in the millions of songs that come out in that wave? Or should we just really focus on other times of the year a little bit more? I would stay away from the holidays. Yeah, uh -huh. definitely staying away. I would stay away from the holidays because even, even, um, you know, even the major record labels, they kind of shut down their releases during the holidays for like two months. Mm -hmm. They kind of just... Whatever they were working, that's that's what's out there, and they don't focus on something new at yeah. those times. Mm -hmm. And you know, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of noise around the holidays because typically, right. let's say, you know, if we're talking about November, December, right? You know, down that uh, down that way. So uh, typically, also the stores, like the DSPs, they close. Also, you know, so a lot of times, like maybe when you're distributing music, you'll see your distributor telling you, "Oh, deliver if you want, even if you want your music to be." Uh, release like the next year you have to deliver it by November something because like the stores totally close out they also around the holidays um, at least like if we're talking December end of year sort of thing um, they also have like all the wrap ups of like the top this top that you know so there's mm -hmm. a lot a lot of noise like around that mm -hmm. um, you know there we typically do recommend you know anything that has to do like springtime you know because obviously like there's they're t well they're Tend, tends to be festivals and and um, um, and a lot of activity, you know, of new music. Uh, but I would steer clear of any big holiday. And if you have specific ones that you're talking about, you know, like if you're going to do a Christmas album, you're going to do a Christmas album. Or if you're doing something around Valentine's, then you're doing it. But just keeping in mind that it, sometimes there are certain, you know, instances that the market is going to be really saturated, you know. Yeah, that I figured, but mm -hmm. I also just thought like, I don't know, like it's as we're trying to market and get things going. Obviously, like so, if I were to try to release something in spring with that four to six week plan, would you say like, but also the shutdown to consider is as far back as November, August, really the best way, or 
Um, yeah, you would have you would have to kind of map it out, you know. So like making sure that you're not touching those months, you know, like mm -hmm. just avoid anything, you know, November, December, um, and map it out, you know, just map it out with time, so it doesn't kind of have a, you know, like it doesn't cross into any like major holiday. All right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you. All right, I'm uh, James with the University of Streets and Corners uh, Brand Consulting. Um, my question, uh, Jeanette, you said uh, like the, the major labels kind of working on archaic models and drying up. Um, just guess, I guess creating more space for independent labels like Symphonic to become more competitive. Um, I guess do you guys have any projects coming out this year that you're really excited about uh, just with that more, with more opportunity to be competitive that you're uh, just really getting, just really excited to get going? Um, especially coming off of COVID with everything returning back to the world, like everything going fast. So uh, just what, what do you guys have coming next? So I think for us right now, I'm really, I'm personally really excited. And we were talking about it earlier uh, about Dochi, you know, that she's kind of blowing up because of, of a TikTok campaign. Um, right now, other than that, um, you know, we, we do have uh, a particular artist. She's, She's based out of Dominican Republic, eh, La Rosmaria. She's also blowing up ridiculously. And, and that's a really good example of somebody that's completely independent because it's literally like the, the little sister of one of the artists. And it's like, it's a family that just like manages this particular artist, you know? Uh, but they've been able to like get a really good team, you know, around her uh, and doing collaborations. Like that also like, you know, like, I think like right now we're we're also we've been talking a lot like internally, you know, about the importance of collaborations, you know, with like other artists, um, in order to kind of like raise your numbers, because um, like that's an example that La Rosmaria, totally independent artist, uh, she now has been featured in like Fresh New Music Friday, Latin, you know, on the Latin side. Uh, she did a collaboration with uh, Romeo Santos, which is like kind of like a balladist over there in Dominican Republic. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I think like that to me has been like kind of like exciting to see that growth, you know, especially with somebody that's completely independent, you know, and they intend to stay independent. So I feel like that's exciting, you know. Mm -hmm. Awesome. How you guys doing? My name is Joe. Um, my question is for both of you guys. Um, so a lot of people probably, not probably, but it's difficult for a lot of people to make a career as a musician. Um, can you guys talk about sort of channeling that same passion that you have for music, but not channeling it towards making music, but towards working in the music industry and these other available positions? So, can I say that again? Sorry. Well, rather than pursuing a music career, right. um, because it is so competitive, and a lot of times you might not have the capital or the resources to you know, take that next step, can right. you guys talk about examples that you've seen of people who have that passion for music, but they, you know, might want to be a manager or work for a distribution company or be a DJ or some other position? Right. I mean, there's, there's opportunities for, for all of that. You know, if you're not an artist, um, say you're, you know, you're, you're, you're passionate for music and you're good with video camera, you know, you can, you can just, you can go to different paths you can go in a different path that's all kind of music related. There's, you know, there's, there's lots of opportunities. Um, doing videos, linking with artists, learning the business, and you know, if, if you have a lot of knowledge of how the business works, maybe you're, you're good at that, and you can get with an artist and, and help them, and let them do their creative thing, and then you try to handle all other stuff. Because that's, that's um, that's kind of a struggle with artists. Um, Mike Mass will tell you, you know, Dynasty will tell you, like, a lot of artists, they don't have a team, and they're doing everything by themselves. You know, they're, they're making the music, they're organizing the video shoots, they're organizing the marketing plan, they're throwing the events, and that takes a lot out of, that just takes a lot to do all of that, you know, and it'll drain you out. So if, if, you know, you want to help if you if you attached if you see an artist that you that you like and you want to help them in a way, you know, approach them and be a part of their team. You know, there's just different opportunities. 
Yeah, I think that, yeah, like, know. that's always a good one, you know, just like, because it, it does get kind of like your foot in the door, sort of like learning how to, you know, like, right, what right. are the needs and, you know, how these things operate. Uh, I remember doing that a couple of times with like different local artists. I was like, I want to manage your socials, you know, like, let me manage your socials, right. you know, like, let me help you with Instagram or let me help you with your website, all this stuff. Right. Um, you know, and talking about like, let's say, starting to work in the music industry, you know, and, and, here in Tampa, you know, it, it is a smaller community. You know, it has huge potential. I think now, you know, with all these, like, sport teams, you know, winning, and, you know, like, there's a lot of, like, eyes now, you know, in Tampa. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think, like, it is going to start growing, you know, like, it, it has a huge potential to, to continue growing. But one thing that I would always recommend is, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's basically, like, two websites that, um, that do have like a lot of um, like are the main websites for finding jobs in the music industry. Uh, there's one website called Music Business Worldwide. That's like the most legit publication, you know, when it comes to to um, the music industry. And then there's another one called Digital Music News, and those are the ones where like everybody, like the Spotify, you know, like every label, independent label, they're all putting those jobs there. And, you know, it doesn't hurt to look into those websites because now, because, you know, we went through the pandemic and, you know, like working situations are changing, there is a lot of remote work, you know, that now can be done, you know, that, that people don't have to be physically, you know, you don't have to be physically in L.A., you don't have to be in New York. I'm sure they would love to pay a salary from Tampa versus having to pay an, an L.A. salary, you know. Yeah. So finding those types of, you know, maybe, you know, starting off, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, entry level positions that don't necessarily, you know, you might not necessarily need a business degree, you know, because sometimes it has to do with like maybe, you know, managing a, a catalog and content or, you know, or, or maybe something that has to do with more like, you know, maybe like on the booking side or something. So I would definitely recommend those those two websites, you know, to to at least like you never know, you know, and Can you once say you those one more time. It's Music Business Worldwide. Okay. Music Business Worldwide and Digital Music News. Digital they music both have a, okay. a job uh, a job section. Um, and yeah, it's unfortunate that sometimes people have to leave. You know, I hate say, like seeing that. You know, it's like oh, you know, like going to another city. You know. Right. Um, Nashville. I think I think here folks here from Tampa, it's easy. A transition to Nashville is pretty smooth. You know, because it's very similar. But you know, and it is a huge city. You know, I say focused on music. Um, but it's unfortunate. But I feel like now that, you know, like I said, because we went through the pandemic, I feel like a lot of companies are willing to be a little bit more flexible. Yeah. I, I always wanted, when I was younger, like, I always wanted to go work for a, for a big record label and, like, move out of Tampa. But I never, like, made that jump. And, and I just focused on my brand here, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. I... And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and one thing, too, that there's this organization uh, that is super interesting. It's called Sound Diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And, they're, you know, Sound Diplomacy, basically what they do is that they develop a economic plan for cities to become a music city. Okay. Sound Diplomacy wants to come here. But uh, but these plans cost, you know, like they're very expensive. They're actually like about like two hundred fifty thousand dollars. You know, that, that somebody has to come up with that money. Right. They don't really implement it for you, but like their case studies are like Austin, the UK, you know, it's like crazy that it's like, okay, this thing works, you know, like this is a, a serious thing. And, um, and part of like, you know, like I, I've read a lot through their website, you know, and like just picking it apart and how these plans are. And one of the major things in order for a, mu a, a city to become a music city is that there has to be more business, like smaller, like businesses, you know, so meaning there has to be more record labels. There has to be more management companies, you know, like to right. kind of start, you know, like that's kind of like the breeding ground, you know. Right. Right. Um, and I feel like we're in a time that we do have these, you know, like collectives. Collectives are sort of like, you know, it's almost like a label. You know, we're almost getting there. We're just calling it a little bit something different. But I feel like events like these, it's so important, you know, to doing things like this because this, like you never know who's in here that's gonna get inspired that wants to then, oh, I'm gonna start my label. You know, like they right. hear your story, right. they get inspired, they know that we have resources, like Symphonic is here, that these, mm -hmm. these resources are available, but that's what's needed more. Like people that are not afraid of like 
kind of taking the leap and right. and starting a business. And obviously, like, it's not easy. You know, you can't tell anybody to start a business and, oh, you're good to go. Like, like yeah. I'm going to start it now. It does take a lot of sacrifice, but but that's, like, a vital, you know, like, element in there. Mm-hmm. So hopefully somebody gets inspired and wants to, like, start a music <laughs> business, you know? Yeah. Um, I have another question. So we all know that there's pros and cons to signing any particular deal, whether it's with Illsboro or Symphonic, and there's different stages in an artist's career that you know are better or worse to sign a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, in your opinions, for your situations, um, I don't know if you're familiar with with the people I'm about to name, but like Barely Legal right. or Johnny Champagne, or basically just an independent artist from Tampa who's about you, who's about to pop off. I, I'd say. At what stage in an artist's career, and I was going to say those two, but if, you don't, if you're not familiar with them, that's fine, mm-hmm. um, should you pursue a deal with Illsboro and Symphonic? So you can just speak for your situations. And if you have, uh, like, history, like, artists you've signed and stuff like that, like, you could tell me a little bit more about their situations and why they signed with you guys. Yeah. So we have, you know, we have, a, like, a certain model that it's, you know, anybody can really sign up with us. It's based on approval. You know, we have to approve you because um, we still are kind of considered a more like a boutique distributor. Um, but I feel like if you are going to be approached, you know, or whomever, you know, you're being approached, sign a deal. Um, it's really important, first of all, you know, for you to understand the value of what that person is going to bring to the table for you. Um, the terms, you know, like just watching out for predatory terms, you know, like nowadays, you know, a lot of artists, they lose like, you know, all their, um, you lose your masters, you know, so knowing like how long will this entity be owning your music, you know, own, rights of your music is really important. Um, and, and yeah, and like the terms for this, you know, because a lot of times, you know, we think, oh yeah, I'm going to sign a deal. I'm going to get X amount of money. But you're really not getting money. You know, that money, you have to make it back, you know. So it feels like, you know, you're not really winning the lotto here, you know. This is not money that you're going to get for you to do whatever you want with it. You actually have to generate sales. And, and you know, understanding what are the marketing, you know, capabilities of that, you know, particular label or entity, um, you know, for them to be able to push your project, you know, because you're going to need those resources that they have in order for you to recoup that money and then be able to see something about it. Um, you know, so our deals are just like, it's just straight up distribution deals. You know, I feel like it's a very fair percentage. We're 15%. We don't own your music. Um, we do have an exclusivity for three years, not on the artist, but on the project itself, you know, that we're distributing. Um, you know, so I feel like that's, you know, I feel like that's pretty standard, pretty fair. Um, yeah, that's like, like with Hillsboro, like you're still owning your music. Um, we're just distributing it and doing a, a, doing a percentage, like a licensing agreement pretty much. So you're still owning the music. Um, but then you, like she said, you have our resources to help, to help you. You know, yeah, and just kind of doing there. and doing a little bit of the math, you know, too, because like I I have a good friend, you know, that she got offered a deal, major record label, and it was ridiculous. It was like they were gonna give her like seventy five thousand dollars for like twelve songs, or I'm sorry, twelve albums. That's a lifetime. Right. That's a right. life for seventy five thousand dollars. Like, like yeah, and right. who does albums? You know, like yeah. you know. Like, like, like in the definition of an album, who knows like how much you know. Yeah, like you're, that's you know. why I like the independent situations because like go back to when I said I was working with um, with Rated R and Two for One Records. Um, when he did a deal, we did a deal with um, Universal, you know, because his record was really hot. It was on the radio here every day, and um, that was a conversation we had when we had lunch. Um, you know, record labels were fighting to get their music on the on the. Um, on the radio, and they're like, and they, they just look at the data, what plays every single, every single hour, every single minute. They know they got teams that look at every major station. And they're like, this rated R song is taken away from, you know, our artists, you know, who is he? So they started calling DJs and influencers here, like, who's this guy? But they did a deal, we did a deal with Universal, and they gave him, he got a nice amount of money for his album, but 
he didn't get to pocket all of that. You know, they're like, you got to go record at this at this studio in Miami. It's a thousand dollars a day. The engineers a thousand dollars. The videos like ten thousand dollars. You want little John in the video? That's another ten thousand dollars, and that all came out of, you know, his budget. You know, and I kind of just saw how that how that works. So I I'm a fan of of the independent, and you know, with Illsboro and Symphonic, you're still owning your music, and it's just a, it's a better situation, I think, to help to help you grow. And the artists that you mentioned, I'm not familiar with them, but I would like to get familiar with yeah. them. So sure. when we're done, make sure you link with me. Yeah, I, I would like to hear him. What's that? Yeah? Okay. Nice. Yeah, I definitely want to check him out. I got one more for you guys, uh, specifically for DJ Sandman. Um, so you have um, experience in, like, the college system doing college radio. Yes, sir. How can an artist, you know, break into the college sort of system? You know what I mean? But, like, how can you get on college radio? How can you get relationships with fraternities? How can you get college DJs to spend it college night at that local, you know, I bar mean, or whatever? You, you just got to do the work, man, and network with them. You really do. You know, you got to find out. Like, you know, when I was at USF, like, the, the artists that are major and superstars now, they used to call themselves, you know. Like, Method Man used to call the station. Fat Man Scoop used to call the station, you know. And he's like... You know, these people are giant now, but they used to call for us to play their records, you know? Do they call and give updates on what's going on? Or is it just like, hey, or like, are they like sucking up, like, oh, trying to, hey, come on, try to play? No, I mean, or are they giving you updates to like, I, I, this happened and this happened to like get you excited about the track? Yeah, you know, certain, like when you call, yeah. like, what are you saying? Like, what's the second call look like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, they, there's definitely follow up calls, definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. And just building relationships. So you got to build the relationships with, you got, you got to look to see those college stations, the community stations, the, the DJs, and other markets that are playing the type of music that you're putting out, you know? Mm -hmm. um, Sway in the morning, you know? Mike's been up on Sway in the morning, but, you know, it's just all about, all about connections. You just got to do the research, you know? It's a, it's a lot of work, but no one's really going to do it for you. You got to really, if you really want it and you're passionate about it, you just got to you got to do that, you know? And I think when you do that, when you're really passionate about it, then other people want to help you and jump on board. Yeah, because they see, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. see you know, your passion. Then, then you know? you're taking that's, it serious. That's kind of like, mm -hmm. like, like, for instance, like when I linked up with Dynasty, um, you know, she's, I met her in Tampa, and that's, that's who we did some projects and who I toured with all over the world. But I, I would call other DJs about her music, you know, and they saw my passion and what we're doing. So they would just get behind it. You know, I would call record labels. Like, I mean, we didn't get a major label deal, but that's all right. But I have major labels helping still push a record for me, you know, just because the people that I know, they're like, yeah, we're going to send this out. We're going to blast this to these DJs or whatever. But it's just, it's just those relationships, you know. Yeah. And they, they see your passion and they want to help you as well, mm -hmm. as long as the product is something that they stand behind yep. and are feeling. Hi, my name is Yuki Jackson. I'm a poet, <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask because, um, and I feel like you answered a part of it just now because um, I feel like throughout sort of the theme is like relationships <laughs> right? Um, and networking. And so I wanted to ask, um, you know, obviously in addition to passion, uh -huh. um, what are some critical components do you think are vital in building an impactful relationship? you know, or building an effective relationship in terms of both, like, within the interaction itself, mm -hmm. but also on the back end of it, like, maybe leading up to that interaction itself. I feel sometimes, like, uh, if you say you're going to do something, do it, you know, mm -hmm. like, your word. Uh, that's really important, you know, because... Um, Obviously, if you you know you're you're developing in a relationship, I feel like uh, what I had mentioned a little bit earlier too, um, knowing the right time when to approach that person, you know, because like you might you know like some of us are gonna meet today and maybe we can't do anything today, but knowing that perhaps down the line, you know, a couple months from now, maybe a couple of years from now, we'll be able to do something. So knowing when is the right time, you know, to connect with a person, um, and. Um, and yeah, uh, I feel like, you know, your word, staying true to your word, you know, 
yeah. uh, I think is important, you know. Um, right. Being around, you know, like if, let's say we talked about something, maybe I never hear from you again, then it's like, meh, you know, like maybe this person isn't really, you know, it's, they're not really committed, you know, like, because like, you know, I feel like we, like, we'll stand behind somebody, like if you're killing it and you're busting ass and you're like, you're doing it, then it's like, I'm going with you and I'm going to help you, you know, because I see your commitment. Um, so right. I think that it has to do with like your word and your passion, you know, like I feel yeah. that's important. And then, and then, like you said, like we might meet here, but, and make a connection, but maybe set up a lunch or a meeting just kind of one-on-one just to, mm-hmm. just to talk more. Cause it depends on what environment, you know, you're networking in. Cause you might be at, at the event and there's a lot going on mm-hmm. and there might be a lot of people like in my ear wanting, you know, this or wanting to talk and telling me about them, but there's just so many and so much going on, like just to have a follow up like a week or two later mm-hmm. is, is very important. Yeah. You know, if you're serious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was like, like going back to Dynasty. Um, you know, when I, when I first saw her perform, I thought she was amazing. Then I had her send me some music. I was like, yo, because I had, I had met her at a concert that I was DJing and she was an opener. And um, she sent me, you know, a couple records. I listened to them, and they were okay. But then I did some other shows, and I put her on a show, and it was just amazing. And I was like, you know, we got to do something. Like, you know, she, like she's the one. You know, that's what I thought in my mind. And then we had a, a couple lunches and just talked about about music, and we're like, let's just try it. And you know, it just it went on to tours overseas. You know, yeah. But it took a while, it took a few months before we kind of connected and got together. But we just stayed in touch and, yeah. and made it work. Yeah. All right. Uh, looks like uh, we're reaching our point for what? time ending. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just want to say um, to everyone, thank you for coming out. I want to say God is good. I'm glad everybody's alive and breathing, you know, during these times. Um, I'm very excited that, you know, COVID is lifting and we can get back to what we're doing. Um, me personally, I just want to say, keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up. Don't listen to nobody. Keep grinding. Uh, and, and thank you again. And this is my first time doing this. So, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate yeah. you having me. No, thank you so much. And thank you, everybody mm-hmm. that came out. You yeah. Know, yeah. And I'll hang out for a little bit too. So if anyone wants to connect, chat it up. Mm-hmm. Share all right, it all right. Info, that's good. Awesome. Yep.